Hey, what's up? Let's Bing go. Bing bong. Bing bong. These are all my friends. Is the I Dan Simpson Show. We do it because it's right. I love the dialectic. His testicles became swollen. Base. Do not come. Do not come. I'm gonna come. Please clap. He's clap. It's a man. Yep. It's man in the hat. I'm gonna ruin this. You are a stupid baby. No. Not me. That's ridiculous. This is Leftist and Chill with Idan Simpson, your host. That's me, Idan Simpson, from the Idan Simpson Show with Idan Simpson. Today, we're going to uh, introduce our guest in just a minute. I do want to remind you to please, please, please support this kind of content. I'm on Patreon, patreon.com slash Idan Simpson. For three bucks a month, you'll get early access to any interviews that you may miss live. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I'm going to introduce my guest now, right this very second. I'm introducing today on the show... Uh, leftist themperer, they them. Uh, we got the famous horse on today. Let's please clap for famous horse. Welcome please on, clap. famous horse. How you doing today? <laughs> please clap. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, hey, what's up? I'm famous horse. I was totally taken aback by the entire intro <laughs> playing in my audio. Yeah, babe. <laughs> Amazing intro. We love that intro. Happy to hear. Hey, it. how you doing going, today? Everyone? What's up? Good to see you. Uh, how's your day going? Tell, tell us about your day. Yeah, pretty yeah. well so far, you know. Woke up about 45 minutes ago, made myself a coffee, uh, just frantically prepped my notes and went over <laughs> some of that, and uh, now I'm here. You have notes for, for our chat. This is perhaps the most serious anyone has ever taken a talk with me. So, oh, um... I, I have... <laughs> so I'm referencing the notes that I did before, so I've got okay. like 25 pages of notes. I'm not referencing all of those. Okay. I'm just going to kind of skim through those. Okay, so we're going to skim through uh, some notes. We uh, we got we got we're going to talk about um, later today the Ukrainian fascism. That's why we in invited you on mm -hmm. today. I think you caught mm -hmm. some of my uh, content talking about um, uh, Nazis, uh, neo Nazis mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Uh, yeah. uh, we're we're going to learn more about that. Try to add. Uh, maybe some more context uh, to our understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you've done some research. I'm interested to hear what you got to share with us. And sure. uh, but before we do that, uh, what, let's talk about. I mean, I mean, famous horse. You're uh, a returning champion to my stream. Uh, uh, right. We've we've gotten to know you, you uh, in the past. Go ahead and let folks know. Uh, you know what you do on your stream and uh, and uh, sure. and what what people can yeah. expect you uh, when they when they when they tune in. Right. Yeah. And last time I was here, I believe we talked about ghosts, but uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm Famous Horse. Normally, we just kind of do uh, very loosey goosey content on my channel. Usually we have a rotating panel of a couple hosts and we come in and we just talk about whatever's going on in the news, react to that given Marxist analysis on it. Most of us are Marxist Leninists. So we just kind of give our reaction to the news. And then we have a little fun segment where we, you know, watch weird content on YouTube, like Kiwami Japan, the guy who makes knives out of crabs. So great content. Whoa, cool. Um, yeah, awesome. the man can make a knife out of anything, apparently. He made a knife out of milk. So, you know, go figure. I don't get it. I'm not sure I want to get I, it. I yeah. don't understand it either. And I watched the video. <laughs> um, awesome. And uh, thank you again for being with me, and thank you for uh, thank you for yeah, uh, sharing you. your time and and uh, and you know like we, uh, like we said uh, sort of the, your expertise or or whatever we can call uh, you know the research that you've done. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. How do we? Do you just want to kick this off? I was thinking we just launch right into yeah, this. Sure. We're, we're I like mean, we're I'll, like we're I like two, two, two and a half months. This. Real quick, real quick. Oh, we're sorry. like two and a half months into this war, right? Um, I d I couldn't have pointed out Ukraine on a map uh, when when uh, you know when the Russian tanks were rolling in. I didn't really know much about it. Um, yeah. But I've been fortunate enough that I found some uh, a good good resources to uh, sort of hold my hand and and nice. uh, uh, and and build understanding. Mm -hmm. One of the first things was actually the Gravel Institute video. Uh, and I'm sorry for my listeners. I got a funny sound effect on my end. Don't worry about it. Um, don't worry about it. It's not your fault. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, I had some good resources. One thing was actually the Gravel Institute piece sort of helped g 
get mm-hmm. the un- some understanding of what's going on there, including you know the the neo Nazi element and that we are sending arms to them. And I remember that day I. I popped my head out the door after I learned about it and me and my partner, you know, we both work from home and, and I said, Oh my God, dude, we're arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine. And she's like, what? So, um, right. anyways, they actually pulled that video down uh, and we don't, we Did never they? really got an explanation for that. Yeah. But, um, from there I went on to listen to like, uh, Brian Becker, people like Brian Becker over there at, um, breakthrough news. And, uh, I've, I've, I've heard uh, from uh, Benjamin Norton as well. Has uh, they've all they've all sort of like these types of yeah, help build Norton, my understanding of what's happening. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like that's sort of where I am. Um, I'm you know I'm wondering how long this war is going to go. Uh, we're already eight years into it. Uh, Fifteen thousand have died. Who knows how many have died in the past three months? Um, yeah. Okay. It's... So that's that's sort of where we are. Uh, and then yeah. I did a little piece watching the Donald Quarter video. He used to be on RT, uh, uh, and uh, he did a piece on the uh, the Azov Nazis, and I did a react to that. You caught that. You offered to come on and help me and uh, and and my audience build uh, context and understanding. So let's. You want to launch right yeah. into it? Let's do it. Yeah, sure. Do it, baby. Take it away. Sure, sure. So, I mean, and just to build off what you're saying, yeah, like it's already been, I think at this point, what, two, three months and already it's been absolutely devastating. And, you know, this is something that I've been interested in looking into well before the war started, right? Like going back to like around 2014 when uh, the Euromaidan revolution of dignity, I'd call it a coup d'etat happened. And, you know, there was a lot of kind of, confusing information coming out of Ukraine. And and it seemed like there may have been neo-Nazis involved. And I, I heard that and I was like, that's kind of weird. So that's what kind of got me interested into it in the first place. Yeah. And it's you know, very I, interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've been following it, not, you know, not super closely until like the past like six months. Um, but, you know, it's something I've been keeping my eye on. And so basically, I, I just put together um, some documentation on the history of some of these groups. And it's, you know, not thorough enough to be a research paper or anything, but it kind of pins out how uh, what are the major players are. Yeah. And it, it's really weird. Like these groups, I, I just want to reiterate, like these groups are not big. Like there's several neo-Nazi groups and like they're popular support is, you know, not big. I mean, they have like Savoba, who's this big neo-Nazi party. They're the one that's like the the moderate one because they've won the most seats in parliament. They won like five to seven percent of seats in parliament. Like they're not massively popular, but there's a lot of these groups and they have a lot of power. And that's where it's kind of weird, right? Because it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, these groups aren't particularly popular, um, how come C14, which is a mm-hmm. neo-Nazi street gang, and, mm-hmm. and you can guess they're neo-Nazis from the fact they have 14 in their name? Yeah. Um, how come C14 was appointed by the Kiev Municipal pa- uh, Council to be an official police force? And mm-hmm. you're telling me that that like the city of Kiev has decided to let a neo-Nazi group uh, patrol their streets to keep, make it safer? Mm. And For who? Yeah, well, uh, for C14, presumably, yeah, yeah. because as soon as they started doing that, like the first thing they did was attack the camp of Romani. So mm. yeah, go figure. The uh, the pogroms. Yeah, I mean, they're just, you know, just a just a little light pogrom. Just uh, but I think um, <laughs> in that video, like awful. there's uh, a fair bit of background on Ukraine, like specifically on um, nationalism in Ukraine, on, on Stepan Bandera. Yeah. And I want to talk about Bandera a little bit. And, you know, yeah. I can outline some of these groups and give you examples of some of the positions and power they have. We can talk about Euromaidan a little bit as well. But um, what do you know about Stepan Bandera? All right. So Chat, what do you know about him? We as our, our basic understanding is that uh, he collaborated with the Nazis and helped to uh, to run the OUNB faction, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, OUN, OUNB uh, and the UPA and uh, and the OUN, really. Uh, OUNB was like the armed mobile group of the OUN. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but yeah. Um, and and then real I quickly, wish I could, real quickly. I wish I could share my screen so you could see this picture I have of him, but he's got not great. Let me just. I'm gonna copy and paste this picture to you. Yeah. The man's got terrible vibes. He does. I don't like this a guy at all. Okay, I just. And this doesn't feel you. like a real picture of him, so I feel like I'm I'm being bamboozled. Yeah, I sent you this a is good him? picture of him in uh your dis uh your Twitter messages. This is him. There we go. Yeah, that's him. What the fuck is going on here? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, what a little weirdo, thanks dude. Thanks to uh, a friend of mine, Miss Pav on Twitter, Miss Pavlichenko. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, friend of mine. Um, she is quite an expert on this much more yeah. than I, much more so than I am. And, um, as I was putting together this research, she helped me find some sources. She helped me provide, she provided me with some context hey. and most importantly, she provided me with that picture. Oh of my Seth God, Lockera. dude. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, uh, Miss Pop. I, I, I thought it was Pavlichenko. Uh, the, um, Pavlichenko, yeah. I sh that's actually one of the people I've I should have uh, uh, reached out to to interview and talk to. They're, they're on the culture.tv a lot, and we're big fans of them, too. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, we've been, like, friend, like Twitter friends for, for a while, and they're, they're a very, very nice person, and they're very smart, and they're always very interesting. Um, but, yeah, yeah, shout out to her for this picture. Um, yeah. Or to for this picture. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so basically, <laughs> I can't get over was that. like an ultra nationalist, uh, in addition to being a dude with absolutely terrible vibes. Like, I don't know why he has an empty pie pan in his hand and he's like chewing on a fork, but I don't, I don't, it, I don't know. This picture is an eternal mystery. We'll never know what was going <laughs> through that, uh, that ghoul's brain at this moment. Um, but he's yeah, sitting he's on like, a little log thing. or something. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> he's like sitting on a little thing. Yeah. His butt's elevated I, I a little bit. I don't know. He's just like sitting on a little log on the grass, just uh, enjoying a nice empty pie pan, as one does. Um, as Nazis yeah, do. So, you know, he was a early 20th century uh, ultra-nationalist, right? Mm -hmm. And basically his central idea was that uh, we need a Ukraine for Ukrainians, blood and soil nationalism. Um, but to him, very specifically, the people that needed to be, um, well not there uh, were Russian speakers, of course, um, Jews, but most importantly, Poles. And yeah. I'm sure there's some kind of complex history there. I don't get it. The OUNB and Bandera really hated the Polish people. So he founds the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, right? And eventually the UPA, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, um, but at this point, right, like it's it's under Soviet governance and he does not like that. Basically, him and these ultra nationalists think, well, if we work with the SS, if we work with the Nazis, um, maybe we can destabilize the Soviets. Maybe mm. we can push them out. And if we do a good enough job and that's why they made the UPA was try to wage guerrilla war, that kind of stuff. But maybe if we do a good enough job. The Nazis would be like, oh, you guys are so smart. Here's your own fascist state. Um, and that's what he thought. He thought that the Nazis would reward his work of the OUNB hey and the UPA with mm. an independent fascist Ukraine. Uh, ultimately, uh, Bandera was so fucking annoying that they <laughs> uh, put him in prison. The, yeah. the Nazis did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, so, he, he eventually got out, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and but, you know, he just gets put in prison for a little bit because he's just they don't want to deal with him. Um, but basically. <laughs> right. So he forms the OUNB or the OUN and they have the armed group, the OUNB, and they have uh, the UPA, the insurgent army. And both of these groups were, you know, Banderist groups. They were put together by him, essentially. And um, two of the big events that people kind of point to now as. Uh, well, a tr crimes against humanity, humanity committed by them is they have the 1941, the Liev pogroms. And Liev is also the town where Bandera was born. Oh. And uh, so Liev was his birth town. And I'd also like to point out that in 2018, Liev announced uh, basically that they were taking the whole year to honor Stepan Bandera. They're like, this is the year of Stepan Bandera. He's a hometown hero. He is the greatest man to be born in Liev. Like, you know, hands up for him. Jesus. 
So, uh, yeah. So in like early, early July, it was like July 1st. Um, there was a group of the UPA, the Nachigal Battalion, which was U O U N B volunteers working in the UPA. Right. Mm. Um, so they, they get to the town and they basically start finding the Jews and dragging them out of their houses, accusing them of being communist, um, doing every sort of humiliation you could imagine mm -hmm. and then killing them. Right. And day or two later, the Einstatzgruppen, uh, which is, you know, one of the most notorious Nazi groups, shows up and kind of finishes the job. But they kind of thought, oh, if we take the initiative, um, they'll recognize us here. Also in 43, uh, the Lipnicki massacre, the OUMB basically uh, liquidated several villages, entire mm. villages full of Polish people, right? Um, because they wanted to establish this ethnically pure Ukrainian state. Um, so I, I, I'm very bad at pronouncing names, the Volhynia region, I believe. Mm -hmm. So they just burned down villages, liquidated everyone in them. And the mm. OUNB commander at the time had stated, uh, we should make a large action in the liquidation of the Polish element. As the German armies withdraw, we should take advantage of this convenient moment for liquidating the entire male population in the age from 16 to 60 years. Uh. So they were planning on ethnically cleansing the entire region. Um, they did not accomplish that, but they did kill a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and all this is just to kind of tell you what kind of person Bandera was, right? You know, mm -hmm. he he wasn't a controversial nationalist. He wasn't a uh, he wasn't an embattled hero or whatever kind of spin you see. Like a lot of time you'll see like a controversial Ukrainian figure step in Bandera. And I don't know if I'd uh, call him so controversial as much as I'd say that he was uh, a war criminal. Yeah. Now, granted, he did not order necessarily these things. You know, he did not carry them out himself. Uh, sorry, I was trying to plug in the camera there, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't carry these out <laughs> himself, um, but it was his group his ideology mm -hmm. and you know we don't know if he had you know given standing orders or whatever right like at least in 43 i'm pretty sure he was in jail so he's not the one ordering these things but these are his groups and this is right. his ideological motivation so and all this is to say you know like when people talk about bandera today like he's very often painted as a just a controversial nationalist um and you see him all over the place like if you can pull up any footage from uh protests mm -hmm. or activist group or activist marches in ukraine over the past 10 years uh especially the Svoboda party right um Svoboda, and a lot I'm sorry. Of this, yes mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff you know it's it's easier to maybe show some of the stuff although if we talk about the uh you know the flags of a lot of these political parties oh, you'll probably get God, the taken down so, no, I, 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 go, I go into the flags, and you're mentioning the flags, and actually, here's the thing, you know, you know, when, when the Russian tanks rolled into town uh, at the end of February, uh, into Donbass, etc., uh, um, you know, there was lots of outpouring of support, you know, um, uh, in, in, you know, all, all over the world, uh, including in Chicago, we have actually a Ukrainian uh, a church. And uh, yeah. and there was a big gathering there. There actually were two two different gatherings. And of course, you start. I started picking up. I, I I pulled it up on Reddit, and people were posting the pictures. And I start picking up on the red and the black flag. And I'm like, yes. well, that's not an anarchist flag. What is that? And you learn. Well, it's the flag of the uh, uh, o, o, o U N, just like we were showing yeah. you here. And yeah. then and then even some people more explicitly uh, fly flags with like literally Bandera's face like imprinted into the flag. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So they, they more explicitly see, tie it together. And you'll see Bandera's flag. And and now the diaspora is a little bit of a different thing because a lot of these people who were like very pro OAN, uh, OUN um, fled the country because they didn't want to live under the Soviets or the Soviets would have arrested them. And Bandera and Banderites also proselytized Ukrainian nationalism mm. in Ukrainian refugee camps on Ukrainians who were uh, 
leaving the Soviet Union, mostly moving to Canada. So you do have a pretty uh, large, extremely reactionary um, sort of uh, group of Canadian Ukrainians. Mm. Um, for example, the uh, I believe she's the finance minister. Um, her fa- her grandfather uh, yeah. was was yeah. the editor for a uh, Nazi propaganda magazine, uh, which um. she has of course said was just Russian propaganda. Uh, there is in Ukraine, or not in Ukraine, sorry, in Canada, there is a cemetery uh, dedicated to a Ukrainian native SS group. Those people who are Ukrainians who are pulled into an SS group. Mm-hmm. And um, if I remember correctly, that group was the one that the uh, that the SS had to tell, like, hey, you guys are making us look bad. You're too violent. You're too deranged. Um, but that cemetery was defaced a couple of years ago, um, saying like Nazi scum or whatever, uh, to which the government said that they would be investigating that as a hate crime, um, a hate crime against who oh, I, I, I don't know, uh, against dead SS officers, presumably. But yeah, yes. And so she held up the OUN colors with Slava Ukraina on it. Right. And um and when people she posted that on Twitter yep. and people started being like, hey, isn't that <laughs> don't you the remember when <laughs> and like, didn't they like do pogroms? And yeah. she was like, didn't reply, deletes the tweet. Yeah. Like puts it back up without Re- the flag. Post it without the flag. Let me show you. Here's one from uh, and she's also standing with the mayor of Toronto. Oh, well, that's um, nice. Here's Chicago. Um, I'm having trouble pulling this up here. It shouldn't be that hard. Here's Chicago. Here's governor uh, of the state with Mayor Lori Lightfoot. You can see the uh, OUN flags in the background. You can see them in the background. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see those in the background. And, like, there's – I can send this picture over to you as well. I'll copy this one. So there's um, – now, maybe I should just send this PowerPoint over to you because it's got a lot of these pictures in here. Um, but, yeah, I'm just going to send this over to you, too. Here's a guy um, in Chicago with Stepan Bandera's face, like, emblazoned uh, in yeah. on the flag. Am I trying to say that? Yeah. Emblazoned, emblazoned. Yeah. It looks um, like a um, cop, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like uh, you'll see kind of um, Bandera's face in a lot of these places or the OUN flag or... Those kinds of things, right? Um, Slava Ukraina is also kind of has a lot of uh, ties mm. to extreme nationalist groups as a slogan. Um, yeah, I, I actually made a video on that, uh, or, or and I mentioned that in the video, and I explicitly say in the video, I say it's not explicitly, it's ex- not explicitly a fascist slogan, but the fascists do love saying it. Right, right, uh, and I, I sent you over. The, the my sources okay. like the, the outline of it. Where am I looking? There's a lot of good pictures in there. I just sent it to you on uh, Discord. Discord, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if the first page still has my name on it or not, though. So okay, I'll be uh, careful. But anyways, so like there was an interview with uh, the mayor of a small town, uh, Konop- Konotop, in uh, with PBS, for example, right? There's this mayor of the small town. They're like, hey, how's the war affecting you? Dude's got a gigantic picture of Stepan Bandera. Hanging behind him. <laughs> and, right. you I'm going to skip and, the first um, slide. The funny thing is, now, I don't know if PBS did this or he just had, like, that Zoom filter that blurs your background. Uh, but the picture is blurred. Uh, but you can still make out that it's Stephen Bondera. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, like, in 2014, for example, uh, 100, sorry, 15K members of Savoba, <laughs> right, which... And we'll talk about Savoba C14 a little bit. Okay. Um, they held a torchlight vigil in honor of Bandera and Liev in his hometown. Um, you know, once again, the site of the OUNB pogrom. Um, massive, you know, 15K people show up all to honor Bandera. Hold up. 2016. Oh, there are no. I'm messing up here. Just keep keep going. I'm going to fix it. No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I just saw that there are no good billionaires. I was like, that's fun. I'm trying, um, yeah. 2016, Kiev City Council votes to rename Moscow Avenue, which obviously is a Soviet era naming, yeah. uh, to Bandera Avenue. So we now have a Bandera Avenue in Kiev. 
My God, dude. 2018, My Ukrainian God. parliament votes to designate Stepan Bandera's birthday as a national holiday. Mm -hmm. So he's got a national holiday. And then, you know, of course, the other thing, 2018, we have the UN resolution on the glorification of Nazism. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, like, don't glorify Nazism. <laughs> and Ukraine don't. and the United States were like the two countries that really voted against that. They're like, oh, I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, if you go to the if you go to the the sixth slide, you'll see the okay. picture of what I was talking about there of that mayor. Two, three, four. Where where am I going here? Five, six. There we go. That slide. This one, research into the right. Uh, up up one. It's just the uh, oh. Bander writes now. Bander writes now. Yeah, one above it. There you go. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, exactly. So you see. You see the mayor right there, yeah. and then that's a Voba Party march. Uh, right, they got right, a right. lot of youth support. You know, they're young, they're hip. Um, the founder Ola Tayana book uh, constantly uh, gets his photo taken with his arm at a forty-five degree angle. Yep. Presumably, he's pointing at something on the ceiling, and they just happen to take <laughs> a picture of him at that moment. Uh, which, whomst amongst us? haven't been caught in a compromising position um so anyway so uh, like that's to kind of provide background on who's some of the you know like the kind of the historical wait, through line yeah? wait you mean the guy that's on stage with mccain uh hold yeah. on let me switch yes you mean this guy wait mccain's on stage with a with a nazi is that a democrat as well uh, chris murphy what's this guy's name chris murphy i want to say uh, I can't remember that guy's name, right. but I also, in here, I have pictures of him meeting with Biden. So, like, yep. oh, Ola yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, met with Biden. Let me try to and find that. he's going to come up during my dawn in a couple minutes. He's going to come up oh. during Euro My Dawn. Oh, I'm excited. Um, yeah, so basically, like, the, the right wing in Ukraine, I mean, it's always existed. It's always been a, uh, a smaller, it was always smaller especially during the soviet years right when there's some repression um but it's you definitely have this massive resurgence of the right wing in eastern europe following the dissolution of the soviet union a you don't have the same sort of like cultural norms anymore and you also have the application of shock doctrine to the entire country or to the mm -hmm. entire area right like the economies are just destroyed and you have you know the slow resurgence of uh of the right wing in all these countries and Eastern Europe is uh, is a particular case where you have a lot of this. It, you know, even Russia has uh, a lot of extreme right wing groups, and even the government is pretty right wing in most of its policies. Right, like they're a very socially conservative, chauvinist, neoliberal government uh, in a lot of ways. Right, um, mm -hmm. they are always. I always support them uh, antagonizing the United States, but. Anyways, though, so basically 2014, right? We have, uh, we have. Mm -hmm. it took me a minute yeah, to find it with, with Biden. There he is. Yeah, there he is. There's Ole Tana book, the, uh, the leader of Savoba hanging out with Joe Biden. Uh, greedy meat loving Joe Biden. <laughs> I, that song is always stuck in my head. You better hide your meat from greedy meat loving Joe Biden. He's going to take your meat. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so 2014, right? Um, yeah. We have uh, the president is fairly pro Russia, right? And, but he has been making dramatic overtures, like he was doing some stuff to honor Bandera, like uh, beforehand. He was like, "Yeah, Bandera is pretty cool. Like we like nationalism," even though he was uh, pretty pretty pro Ukraine, or sorry, uh, sorry, pretty pro Russia, right? Um, so you start having these protests and it's ended up being what's called the Euromaidan protests or the revolution of dignity or a color revolution or a coup d'etat, depending on who you ask. Right. Um, so you start having these bigger and bigger and bigger protests across Ukraine. Mm. Um, they're pretty disorganized at first and you have some kind of limited clashes with the police and security forces. Uh, what ends up happening is you start having these right wing groups, uh, most notably is Savova, right sector and C-14. Yeah, it's not a great picture, right? Um, right sector and C-14 and they kind of start 
taking the reins. So imagine you kind of have like an Occupy Wall Street sort of situation, right, where you have a fair amount of popular discontent because people aren't just upset at like the fact that he's pro-Russian, right? Uh, they're upset at some of his policies. A lot of the people think, that, you know, maybe if we join the EU or we move more west, uh, economic conditions will be more favorable. You know, there's just a, a general amount of discontent, right? So imagine you have kind of like an Occupy situation uh, and then like the Rise Against movement or Adam Waffen or something comes in, gets support from China and takes the reins of the protests. And, and that's basically what happened, right? You had this kind of power vacuum as this is going on. Right sector, Savoba and C14 um, start taking a lot of power. Now, right sector and, Civoba and C14 were kind of like roughly affiliated with Savoba. You have a lot of overlap in some of their members. Um, but they start insinuating themselves into the protests. So like this was like two months ago or less. The leader of C14 in an interview said, if it wasn't for the 10 percent of us protesters who were neo-Nazis, my dawn, the protest would have been nothing but a gay pride parade. Oh, my God. Yeah. Which uh, is a to him. That's a bad thing. To me, that's a good right. thing. But to him, that's a bad thing. Of course. Um, right. So. What you kind of have is these militant neo-Nazi groups insinuating themselves, kind of taking the reins of these protests, radicalizing a little bit more, um, amping up the violence, amping up the the tension. And eventually they literally right sector leads a march on parliaments and they literally throw a coup d'etat. Right. Uh, one of the catalysts was the Euromaidan snipers and nobody. Mm -hmm really knows who the Euromaidan snipers are. It's been said they were security forces, but security forces were also sniped. Um, so mm. anyone's guess who it was, I'm just going to say CIA. That's because that's a safe bet. Safe bet. Um, um, safe yeah. bet, right? And I'll just chime in and say real quick that yeah. uh, after they did the undemocratic coup, you know, I, I actually, I think in the Ukrainian uh, parliament or whatever, they tried to, uh, you know, put through the formal um, uh, articles or whatever of, uh, of, of impeaching the president, even though I think they have a different yeah. term for that. And it didn't have the votes, but they still forced them out anyways. It's, um, that's yeah. my understanding. And again, they did storm the, storm the uh, again, parliament. I don't know what the, what the term is. They almost lynched the guy in the street. You know, he escaped, I think, just yeah. hours before or something like that. Yeah. You know, they, so, it almost so got Gad Gaddafi them, right? Yeah, no, the, I mean, he would have probably ended up that way if Yorosh and Right Sector had gotten their hands on him first. But, you know, it's the Right Sector, um, and then you have Savova members and C-14 members, but Right Sector was the one kind of leading the charge Yeah. Uh, with C-14. They're the ones who, they just storm the parliament, right? And they're just like, all right, it's done. So during this point, uh, we have a lot of leaked phone calls and leaked texts between the U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt um, and Ole Tianabuk and other Ukrainian neo-Nazi groups, uh, leaders of these groups, right? Um, so really? <laughs> the U.S. ambassador is telling the leader of Savoba Party, the guy you just saw pointing at the ceiling in front of a lightning strike, um, told him <laughs> that he was to remain on the outside for optics reasons, right? Like, we don't want right. you too visible. Uh, but you are to remain and consult with the new president four times a week is what the U.S. ambassador told him. You're to consult with the new president four times a week. Yeah. So also after Maidan, uh, Svoboda is rewarded with three cabinet positions for their help in the coup. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have this, the foundation of this new Ukrainian government um, that was made possible with the muscle of these neo-Nazi groups, right? And, you know, there's still a, a large amount of popular sentiment behind um behind maybe having some sort of governmental change. Um, but what you have essentially happening is you have a lot of people who have um, nationalist sympathies. Some of them are neo-Nazis, a lot of them aren't, um, but a lot of them also are very sympathetic to neoliberal economic policy. So that's kind of the foundation of the new Ukrainian government. And, and you've seen like, you know, a lot of neoliberal policies implemented, like changes to the social safety net, changes to like a lot of internal policies um, to be more neoliberal, to be more in line with um, what the EU would like, right? Mm -hmm. 
So there's, you know, three major groups there or four. We haven't even touched on Azov, you know, right sector. So that's 2013. Um, they were street fighters and they are part of a group called the Social National Assembly. There's a Social National social Assembly. National? And social National? You mean National Socialists? You can't slip that past me, famous source. They're Nazis. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, so there's the Social Nationalist Assembly and then there's like the Social Nationalist Union Party or party union, there's like two different groups that both have social nationalist in their name. But yeah, right? Uh, it sounds like national socialist, except <laughs> you just reverse the words and you cut off the ist. Um, yeah, so this group, they viewed themselves the successor to the, I, uh, to the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, uh, C-14. Their name comes from, well, the 14 words, right? Um, Funnily enough, a Ukrainian court a couple of years ago ruled that it was illegal and defamatory to call them neo-Nazis. Wow. Yeah, so you can't call them neo-Nazis. The so they were doth protest too much. Sorry, yeah, go on, go on. No, 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 sorry, That's what were you saying? I cut you off. Uh, we got a little cross talk. I was just riffing. I said the lady doth protest too much. Yeah, well, you know, when a judge says you can't be mean, you can't be mean. Um, so they were a, a youth wing of Savoba, and then you have Azov and Savoba, right? Savoba is like the most official. They're an established political party. You know, they have seats in parliament. Now, both of these guys have or have had seats in parliament. Ole Tana book, Yorosh, the founder of, uh, of Right Sector, has had seats in parliament. Uh, the founder of Azov has had seats in parliament. Um, but yeah, Savoba founded pretty early, 95, pretty shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and they're the most moderate of these groups, strongly pro-Pandera. So I am kind of always get my wires crossed because there's the Social Nationalist Assembly and the Social Nationalist Party, SNA and SNPU. Can't remember which one's which half the time. Um, but they ended up changing their name to Savoba after Ole Teana book took in charge and he kind of moderated okay. it a little bit. Um, initially they had the Wolfs, the Nazi Wolfs angle in their flag, yeah. which uh, he removed. Azov still has the Wolfs angle or did for years, but he removed the Wolfs angle. But yeah, so Foboda, but anyways, and then Azov, right? Um, they're a volunteer group to basically fight the separatists in uh, Donbass. And the separatists in Donbass, that happens in reaction to the coup during Maidan, right? right. Um, you have the coup in Maidan, you have the very pro-Russian, both culturally, ethnically, um, and politically, in uh, groups in Crimea and Donbass, who kind of see what's going on and uh, get a little spooked. And, you know, Crimea kind of wants to leave. Donbass, a lot of people in Donbass want to leave. And it's not just like ethnic tension because these people are really not liked by these neo-Nazi groups. And it's not necessarily just ethnic tension. It's also they see themselves as kind of um, a continuation of like the Soviet mindset. And they don't like that. Um, so in addition to being ethnically or culturally Russian, just because they speak Russian, um, they're also kind of post-Soviet. So Azov is kind of this volunteer group that forms in 2014 um, to fight against these separatists, right? So you have the annexation of Crimea, and then you have these these areas kind of voting like to succeed. You have the formation of like the Donetsk and Don uh, Donbass People's Republics. Anyways, though, so Azov forms... Um, they start fighting pretty immediately, and they actually have some successful military operations, the first and second battle of Maripol, and uh, they very get quickly, very quickly are uh, integrated as an official part of the Ukrainian National Guard. Uh, now, when Azov is formed, um, their initial flag has both a Sonorada and uh, Sonorada and a Vosangle on it, yeah. which is pretty sick um, because it's like, hey, in case you weren't sure, <laughs> uh, we're doubling down. So we're going to put two in our flag. So if you don't know what's going on, you're like, wow, that's cool. It's a sunrise over the wave of Ukraine. Uh, yeah, um, they are, um, as of obviously, they're, they're one of the most controversial groups. Uh, they've been accused of torture. They've been accused of war crimes. Um, you know, part of the reason Russia said that they were invading was that there was genocide in the Donbass. Now, I, I 
couldn't find super solid evidence of anything like that. But we do know the Ukrainian government's been shelling Donbass for a while. Azov is particularly violent sometimes. And uh, yeah, but they've kind of become a symbol of the international right. And they're like a nexus, according to the Sofon Center, which is uh, basically a center on terrorism founded by a former FBI agent. Um, Azov has emerged as like the new ISIS, <laughs> like they're a nexus in the formation of international right wing terror. And uh, that kind of does come back up. But yeah, so I'm trying to think of, you know, whether we should talk about Azov there, or I should just kind of give go through the rest of these, like the positions of power that these people have. Um, yeah, you can any, any rabbit hole you want. I'm, I'm, I'm vibing here. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just kind of outline some of the positions of power these guys have. Cause like I said earlier, right? Like these guys aren't super duper popular. Um, it's not like 30, 40% of the Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian population supports these people, right? That, that's not the case. Now, Azov had like, you know, some popular support because they were fighting against the people who uh, invaded the country, right? Like, you know, as far as most people are concerned, just the Russians just invaded the country and started murdering Ukrainians. And, um, you know, anyone who's fighting back against that can be very popular. And, and you know, like, I guess, great fight back against the Russian invasion because that's a whole other thing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, like the, the Russian pretenses, denazifying and that kind of stuff, like, you know, like there's Nazis in Ukraine, but uh, I don't see how they're going to do anything except for make the situation worse by invading Ukraine, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, no, but, I, I don't um, buy that either, mm -hmm. for sure. No, I'm with you. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, we might end up with this sort of situation where Ukraine is so destabilized that the government loses any legitimacy. And then, you know, the only people who have uh, influence and power are now these you know, Nazi groups who have unfortunately received a shit ton of arms and training from the United States. So, um, yeah, so like so C-14, we're coming back to them, the street sure. gang, like they've received um, funding it's not a lot of funding, uh, like 50,000, 60,000 from the Ministry of Youth and Sport to conduct uh, summer camps. So they're running uh, patriotic educational Ooh, projects yeah. for kids. Those are rough, dude. The camps with mm -hmm. the kids and the kids are like wearing the Azov shirts and whatnot. Yeah, so that's a different thing. And I sent okay. you that link. Um, so the Guardian did a documentary on this because Azov is also running summer camps as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So there, Azov is running summer camps. And uh, the Guardian did some investigative reporting into this in 2017, where they yeah. basically just went to the Azov summer camp and they just hung out there, right? Yeah. And it's pretty nuts. It's like, up. they're like kids as young as like look like some of them are like 10 or maybe even younger and they're teaching these kids you know running through obstacle courses like it's basic training teaching them how to uh to use an ak-47 with cutouts and um yeah we got the footage right here yep and if you scroll through like a lot of their yep little kid learning how to clean and load a gun mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. says ass off on their shirts mm-hmm yep yeah, and um, <laughs> if you look, a lot of the a lot of the instructors have neo-Nazi tattoos. At one yeah. point, one of the instructors has a giant Totenkopf tattoo on the back of his neck. The no. Totenkopf being the SS death's head. Yeah, uh, the skull. No yeah. way. And uh, they ask another guy in here, like, "Hey, um, basically, like, what's up with all the Nazi tattoos?" And the guy has like a giant sonarat on his arm, and he's like, them. "Oh." I don't know. I think a lot of us just think they're kind of neat. What, dude? Oh, here? It, yeah, it's right, like, right towards the end. It's that guy. It's that guy, yeah. What is going on there? And there's the guy with the totem comp, yeah. He gets inked. He shouldn't be judged. Yeah. So he's saying, I just have tattoos of things I like. He's got the he's sun like, and rod on his elbow. I see now. Okay, okay. White pride. There. Oh, mm -hmm. fuck! There's the sun and rod with the nazi symbol if that like yep. if the sun and, and rod the wasn't the nazi enough yep. they stuck they stick the swastika right in the middle get out of here 
Yeah, well, I mean, like, you got to compress the neo-Nazi symbols oh together gosh. into one mega neo-Nazi symbol. Oh, there's the neck. Oh, with SS, with S's on the side, too. Yep. Oh, my Lord above, dude. All right. Uh -huh. That's 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 yeah. the insane shit about. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to try to deny so it. Fuck you. That's no. That's off summer camp. Um, that's the that's ass off, off summer, summer camp. camp. Yeah. Right. So and, and like I'm saying, like these people have like weird connections to power. Like it's really weird that they're just like running a summer camp and the, <laughs> the government's like, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you can teach her. You can teach kids how to use assault weapons and uh, the glory of, uh, you know, your nationalist ideology. Right. Like uh, there's a pretty infamous incident and the picture is in there where C-14 hosted a. Um, a I'm sorry. You gave me a link. You gave me a link. Where am I uh, looking? It's in my it's in the PowerPoint I gave you. Oh, sorry, um, I can okay. just also send you the I got picture you. I directly. Got you. I got you. I'll pull it up. That's my bad. My bad. Mm -hmm. bad. No, you're fine, man. Uh, it's slide 11. Um, but C-14 hosts this fundraiser slash charity kind of thing to uh concert to raise money for veterans right is what they said um it's headlined by a neo-nazi band called the acts of perun um very neo-nazi sounding name and uh crazily enough we have some star attendees because the prime minister under Zelensky at the time shows up and uh the prime minister and the head of veterans affairs show up and the prime minister is like goes up on stage, grabs the mic and, you know, gives a little speech. Uh, is this it? Where am I looking? Uh, page or uh, slide 11. So just scroll down. It's a green photo. You'll you'll recognize it. Green photo. Well, maybe you're not getting the full. Oh, it looks like you're not getting the full thing. Actually, I only have so you got like a fucked up version of it. I am oh, so sorry. sorry. Oh, I can't win them all. Oh, well. And I'm sorry, I haven't oh, well. figured out how to get allow people to share their screens. Yeah, that's just a limitation. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I'll just send you. So I guess the one that's saved on my computer and not on uh, OneDrive is uh, not complete. So that's my bad. I, as soon as you, as soon as you're like, where is it? I was like, oh, it's oh, yeah, there's like six slides there. OK, you just sent the picture, though. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah. So sorry. I about sent that. It thanks, no, no, thanks that's for bearing my with bad. me. That's all so that's 100% on me. I didn't notice that earlier. Oh, no. I'm actually not 100% familiar with this sort of swastika-looking symbol. So, I'm trying to remember exactly. I think that's oh. a Slavic sun wheel. Um, I believe that's a Slavic sun wheel. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. It's a Slavic sun wheel with some modifications, right? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like I said earlier... Uh, C-14 was given policing powers. The leader of Azov, Andrei Bilecki, has been a member of parliament for a while, and he was associated with some of the other social national groups. Um, Bilecki, so the guy who founded Azov, right? And remember, we've had some debates in the West over whether or not Azov is really neo-Nazi or not, right? Um, when he founded Azov, he was spoke to the Telegraph. This was like 2014 or so. And he said, the historic mission of our nation, the nation of Ukraine, at this critical moment is to lead the white races of the world in their final crusade for survival against the uh, I'm not going to finish that quote. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. It's awful shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's not great. Right. Um, also, last year. President Zelensky gave the medal of the hero of Ukraine to this guy, uh, Dmitry. He was a right sector volunteer in the Donbass who liked to joke that he fed his pet wolf the bones of Russian speaking children. Oh, my God. So it's like the kind of thing where it's like, you know, there's a lot of tacit approval of some of these things. Right. Um, yeah. and maybe because they're useful maybe because they're not, but you know, like Azov really comes down to being like the, the, the biggest threat and we haven't touched on them too much, but Azov is, you know, they're the infamous one. Like they're the ones people talk about, like, and they are, you know, honestly a, a threat because like, you know, Charlottesville, right? We all remember Charlottesville, mm -hmm. um, the rise above movement who are the people who helped like plan Charlottesville. Um, those guys, uh, were trained 
by Azov. Like they went, they met with Azov in Ukraine, trained with them and stuff like that, right? So <laughs> it's it's not great, right? Um, we also had some point around 2015, 2016, um, the CIA began a counterinsurgency program or mm -hmm. insurgency program and uh, began training uh, Ukrainian nationalists, right? So the CIA started training insurgent leaders in Ukraine in 2015 to prepare for the eventuality of a Russian invasion, right? Um, now, we don't have a dossier. We don't have a list of members. Like, that's not public information. Um, but presumably, this has included quite a few Azov members because they are probably one of the, they're one of the largest paramilitary groups, right? And the, the sort of paramilitary violence has been going on since 2014. Like, very shortly after Maidan, you know, Maidan was pretty bloody. Shortly after that, uh, you have the Odessa trade union massacres, which I'm sure you've talked about on your stream before. That's, um, no, that's not ringing a bell. So, uh, basically, after Maidan, right, it, it, there's kind of this split. And this is yeah. kind of what also triggered um, some of the stuff in Crimea and Donbass. So, you have uh, a lot of anti-fascist protesters. Oh, okay. I actually... You have a lot go, of go on, but yeah, I, I, I'm a, I was vaguely aware. I just couldn't put the, the name to it. I remember they torched the oh, building. Sure. They torched the building with right. people inside. Yeah, go on, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so you just have a lot of these anti-fascist protesters, and they began clashing with uh, nationalists and fascists, with right sector and these other groups, right? Uh, anyways, long story short, they end up in the Odessa Trade Union building, which gets set on fire by the fascist protesters. Oh. Um there is footage of it that I've unfortunately seen, um, but yeah. people are jumping out and people who are like running out or jumping out, some of them are getting shot. They're like strafing fire into some of the doors in the building, <laughs> beating people as they come out. So we don't have an exact death toll, but quite a few people died. And that was a very like catalytic event between, yeah. um, you know, to kind of militarize the right further and to kind of, uh, will spook a lot of the uh, the left wing or anti-fascist groups or even just pro-Russia groups, you know, like modern Ukraine. Um, a lot of the left wing groups have recently been banned, um, left wing political groups for, you know, association with Russia and those sorts of things. But they can't ban the Nazis, neo-Nazis. Uh, no, they can't. Um, Fascinating. And like, that's the other thing, too. You know, like when we talk about like, think about how much funding is going to Ukraine, like. We just approved another 40 billion in weapons to go to Ukraine. All right. Of course, the uh, United States is currently a roiling mess of financial and social crises. Uh, but, you know, we're approving more funding for weapons. Right. And the thing is, like, we don't know where those weapons are going. There was a report like a month ago where. The U.S. is like, yeah, uh, we don't know where our weapons are going. And the Ukrainian government says they're not sure really either. And they even if they knew, they wouldn't tell us where the weapons are going. So, you know, uh, live and let live, live, laugh, love. Uh, if these weapons end up in the hands of uh, Azov or whatever, you know, NBD. But yeah, so like the CIA has been training insurgents to prepare for there and um, like 2015, uh, we start providing, you know, we've been providing military funding to Ukraine around 2015. Um, we were trying to put a specific ban on any funding and any weapons going to Azov, right? Yeah. Uh, Congress was, they're like, these guys are dangerous. Like we don't want any of our weapons going to them. Uh, the DOD actually stepped in and squashed that. And they're like, no, no, you, you're going to send weapons or not. You're not going to send weapons to them. They're like, no, there's no need for you to stipulate Azov specifically because they're a radical group. Uh, the Leahy Act will cover this. Don't worry. They're not going to get any weapons. Right. Um, they kind of made sure that pro specific prohibition didn't go into place. And sure enough, the next year, there's a large order of Airtronic uh, PSLR. PSRL-1 rocket launchers, right? These uh. are su sufficiently advanced rocket launchers, like uh, RPGs. And there's a large order of them, Airtronics in Texas, there's a large order of them going to a unnamed Eastern European ally. There we no. go, there's the Airtronic, 
right? Um, just a classic looking rocket launcher. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, they're pretty expensive too. Really? They're like, I think like like 70, 80 K unit or something. Dang. Anyways, there's a, there's a decent order, right? That's going to a unnamed Eastern European ally. It might've been Ukraine, who knows? But anyways, uh, about mm, like a third of the purchase, 555 K of these rocket launchers somehow ended up in the hand of Azov. And we know they ended up in the hands of Azov because Azov took pictures yeah. of them with the rocket launchers and posted it on their website. And this has been authenticated, like this whole thing has been authenticated by the Atlantic Council's uh, digital forensics team. And the Atlantic Council is about as pro-NATO as you can get. I mean, there's a reason they're called the Atlantic Council. <laughs> yeah. uh, right? So like we end up, we have this like weird situation where it's like, hey, uh, who are those rocket launchers for? Uh, unnamed your Eastern European ally. Well, how did, how did they end up with Azov? They're like, that's weird. I don't know. Uh, that's my bad. Um, but yeah, like we, yeah, so like 2016 too, like the, uh, we're providing more funding for Eastern Europe or sorry for Ukrainian government for weapons, lethal aid, all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, once again, we know some of it went to Azov. We, we don't know how much went to them, but we do know a bit has gone to there and they've continued receiving support. Right. Like they've received U.S. funding. They've received training like on multiple occasions before the war broke out. Uh, Azov will like post on their website like, hey, the homies from NATO are here to train us on how to use whatever. Right. And then NATO's always like, no, just fucking take that picture down. Like, take that down right now. And then they remove it from their website. Um, the same thing happened at the beginning of the war. There was a picture that got shared by an Eastern European news agency that was like, hey, the boys from NATO are here to train the Azov battalion volunteers yeah. on how to use these the stinger launches. missiles. Can I tell you a real quick story? I had that yeah. I had that that picture up on screen and I had a, a someone in my chat go, Dan, there aren't as many Nazis as you see. Mm hmm. And I'm like, what kind of Jedi Nazi mind trick is that? I'm looking at a room full of them. Like, what the fuck does that mean? There aren't as many as I see. How many do I see? <laughs> right. Oh, you can't count. Oh, and I just sent over. Uh, this is a screenshot, an archive screenshot from uh, Azov's website. Um, this was from when was this photo from? This is from 2017 Super um, of Azov saying, basically, uh, we've just met with NATO advisors. <laughs> So the guy, the the old man in the funny hat, that's a NATO advisor. And yeah. he's he's meeting with Azov, you know, giving them some advice and tactics and all that, right? Uh. So kind of you have this situation where, like, so they don't have a lot of support, but they are well-connected in government, right? Azov is well-connected. The founder is in parliament. Uh, we have Ole Teana book. He's in parliament. And these people are like... You know, they're just like oddly, weirdly well connected and mm. they have a lot of support. So, you know, and Azov is an official part of the Ukrainian National Guard. So all these weapons that are flowing into Ukraine, a lot of them are going to end up in the hands of not just Azov, but other extreme right wing group militias. And it's kind of this situation where Azov in particular is is worrisome. Like I said, they were identified as the basically the nexus of right wing terror. Like they are going to serve. There's the concern that they are going to serve as the future nexus of right wing terror. And they're already propagandizing, radicalizing and trying to get volunteers, you know, to come to Ukraine mm -hmm. so they can train them. And the war has been a really good chance for them to do that, to recruit uh, sympathetic uh Sympathetic, let's say people who are sympathetic to their beliefs to come to Ukraine, help them fight, and then they can train them. Um, there was a French farmer. Uh, I think his name was like Gregor Montague or something. I don't know. He has a very funny French name. And uh, he was radicalized. He was in communication with Azov. And he was caught trying to cross the border to Ukraine with thousands of rounds of ammunition, dozens of assault rifles explosives, grenades, and all of this. He was caught bringing these, trying to bring them into Ukraine. He was going to meet with Azov, and then he was planning on using those to carry out a terror attack. Um, he just got caught on the border. So, 
you know, so they've been in communication with a lot of these groups and, you know, like with all the funding we have pouring into Ukraine for lethal aid, right? Like all this funding is going in and I mean, it's not like we're funding infrastructure projects. We're, we're not really helping the lives of an average Ukrainian. We're making, we're, we're making, making their lives yeah. hell. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, all we're doing is pouring fuel onto the fire. And oh like, God. yes, of course, like Ukraine has the right to self-determination and the war, hopefully this war ends as soon as possible. Mm. Right. Um, but essentially what we're kind of doing is just pouring fuel into the fire. Like Zelensky kind of said that he implied that he got baited, like that he was kind of told that um, he would have a place in NATO. And then after the war kind of started, NATO told him, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, you are never joining NATO. Uh, but don't talk about that publicly because the optics are bad. Wow. And it seems kind of like they baited him into going into this proxy war. Yeah. Now, um, when Zelensky was elected, he was elected as the candidate of peace. He said that yeah. he was going to end the fighting with the separatists. Right. He was going to make peace in Donbass and he was going to deescalate tensions with Russia. After he got elected, though, uh, a lot of the extreme right wing groups in Ukraine said, yeah, no, you're not doing that. And if you do do that, you're a dead man. Uh, remember what happened in 2014? You don't want that to happen again. Mm. And he very quickly kind of changes his tune and he, you know, starts uh, taking a more hostile tact and, you know, just kind of keeps things business as usual. But um we're kind of headed to this situation, I think, where Ukraine might be the Afghanistan of, of Europe in a sense, right? Where if this war continues, the country is going to be devastated. The Ukrainian people are going to be immiserated. Um, infrastructure is going to be destroyed. These people's lives are going to be ruined even more than they already are for a proxy war between NATO, United States and, and Russia, right? And like I said, like if this country ends up further destabilized, right? Like imagine the war ends in six, seven months, right? And it ends on unfavorable terms for Ukraine because it's almost certainly going to end on unfavorable terms for Ukraine. Uh, maybe they have to secede the Donbass, right? Well, that's going to really weaken Zelensky's regime's position, right? They're going to be much weaker and they're going to lose a lot of popular support. And at that point, you know, who's got the arms, who's got the training, who's got um, some political support, right? You know, you only need five, 10 percent of the population to carry out uh, a revolution or anything like that. Um, who's got the support, right? And even if those people don't succeed in uh, influencing the government or throwing another coup d'etat, uh, you very well may end up with a situation like a post-Gladio years of lead where you have these right wing groups that are armed, trained, and motivated um, in a permissive area where the government's too weak to rein them in, or maybe the government's unwilling to rein them in. And, you know, like, how is NATO going to react when, like, six years from now, you have uh, an Azov-inspired terrorist or fearist, since we're on Twitch, we'll say a fearist, uh, carrying out an attack in Berlin? You know, like, how are they going to react to that? And, and even the situation in general over the next couple of years with all the weapons pouring into Ukraine, like most of Europe has pretty good arms control. Um, what's going to happen after billions of dollars of small arms pour into Ukraine? They're not going to stay in Ukraine. Like who knows what's going to happen with billions of dollars of small arms just flooding Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, as Comrade Clinton says, there were other mm -hmm. uh, unintended consequences, as we know. No, we're worried about these unintended consequences that are uh, that have already happened with these these arms that we've sent to Nazis that maybe yeah. we haven't even heard about that maybe we'll never hear about unintended consequences that haven't even happened yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, like you said, dude, suit like the Ukraine will be the 90s against providing the world with small arms. Yeah. And you're going to have like you have tons of small arms and you're going to have people who either need money or are ideologically motivated. And like, again, like Azov is a nexus of right wing extremist groups. And what are what are they going to do? <laughs> like, what are they going to do? They are obviously going to continue radicalizing and trying to foment these things and funding them if they can. I mean, Charlottesville was just a taste, right? Like mm. that was just a very small scale 
of the kind of influence these groups can have. And now uh, that's what they did, you know, six years ago. Uh, imagine what they'll be able to do in the future with probably a billion dollars in siphoned arms. Because how much have we sent to Ukraine so far? I can't, we don't I can't know, right? Track. It's yeah. I think they make it hard to keep track. You know. Yeah. Um, and of course, this this next bill, bill, Biden asked for 33. The Dems in the in Congress were like, "Hey, how about 40?" What the fuck? I'll do you want better? Yeah. I'll do you want better? See, that's the way the Dems negotiate, right? You're like, "Hey, I want." They could find the money for war. Billion, and then the Dems are like, "Ooh, that's pretty tough. I'll do 45." And you're like, "Wait, aren't you supposed to go down and negotiate?" You're like, "No, no, no, no. We just want a deal. We'll go up." 50 and that's my final offer like yeah okay we'll give you 50 honestly we have not yet seen this bill's final form <laughs> yeah we haven't seen its final form but maybe by the end of the month um we will get 100 billion in fund zelensky i think he said he wanted like 10 billion uh, a month in funding from the united states Ugh. at one point something something like that he wanted a billion some form of billion a month i can't remember the details yeah Maybe 80 billion. Yeah, that's bipartisanship. We, You're right. That's bipartisan. At the end of the day, we'll never know how much money we've sent. You know, we'll never know. No, no, because we won't, right? Because, like, even what we know uh, publicly, like on the public ledger, right. there's, of course, like a lot of black ops stuff. And, like, you know, like the CIA program I was talking about to train Ukrainian insurgents. Um, yeah. Like that program. Now, that was fortunately much more limited than the one we did in, like, Syria, for example. Um, okay. But, you know, like, I, I don't know why they haven't learned that if they train and arm extremist groups as a bulwark against one of their enemies, that uh, in this case, Russia, that it doesn't work out. Last time we funded, trained and armed extremists against Russia, we got 9-11. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, at the end I, of the day, though, that's that's how. They they maintain that's how they build their consent, you know. The you know, we they're like, Well, we got this whole big military here. You don't want us to mm -hmm. use it against the terror? They just hit our yeah. buildings, right? Um, you know, the United States thrives off of off of chaos, you know. It, 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 that's how totally. that's one of the ways it maintains its global hegemony, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and it's like, um, you know, it's very kind of obvious, right? Like after the Cold War ended, you know, we did a new enemy. There was like that weird period for a couple of years where Japan was the enemy. Yeah. Which yeah. Was like super weird, right? There was like all those news articles. They're like the rising Kabuki demon. Like, will Japan destroy America within 10 years? And then they're like, OK, well, we need to come up with a new one. Uh then, you know, we had the war on terror. Yeah. Now we have China and Russia. So, you know, we always got a fresh supply of enemies going. Yeah. So it went it went from the communist being the being the enemy to uh, I, I guess I didn't know this little in between thing. Um, the Jap, J Japanese, I guess, being the it, enemy it and, like and a, now, like now radical terror thing. Um, and now so Russia, it was China. like in the 80s, in the 80s and early 90s. So like towards the end of the Cold War. Hmm. The United States was like really scared of Japan for some reason. They were like afraid that Japan was going to like come and economically dominate us, which is why if you're a fan of the cyberpunk genre or, you know, Blade Runner, have you noticed that cyberpunk always has like a very Japanese aesthetic? Yeah. Right. That's that's why, because most cyberpunk stuff came out in the late 80s or that period. And that was the time when like the cultural ethos was like, this is going to be the Japanese century, like the Japanese are going to buy up America and all that. And of course it never happened, but, uh, um, wow. yeah. So that's why you have that kind of like vibe and you know, like Blade Runner is a really good example of that where, yeah. you know, all over everything's in Japanese. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I definitely learned something there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Uh, pretty much the discussion on it. I mean, if you have any questions or Chad has any questions for me about it, I'd be happy to, uh, attempt to elucidate um i didn't have any questions it just felt like you know i've done tons of deep dives on this since you know mm -hmm. like like i mentioned to you i didn't know shit about ukraine yep. i couldn't pick pick it out on a map but i've gone into in i've, I've done the deep dive you know what i mean so you were mm -hmm. touching on pretty much all the stuff that i that i'd learned about and 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 i think you helped help me with some of the details as well um 
It was only one thing I had a question about, but it wasn't that yep. big a deal. It's more of like, a, hey, I wonder what, where I can get that resource. I can't remember what it was. Maybe I'll catch it on the replay. Um, but yeah, chat, do you have any questions for the famous horse, for the well-known equine? That was that that honestly reflects my understanding of uh, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. And I, I uh, honestly, I've, it honestly feels like you've been watching my stream and then you just like took all of the talks that I've done about Ukraine and just condensed it into about an hour talk. Like it, it really felt like that. I was well, like, yeah, yeah, is, I was just vibing. I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry to hear that then. I was hoping that I could provide no. you with some, some new details and some new understanding in this. No, it's, no, it's, that's not, I'm not disappointed at all. Uh, this is, this is a, an absolute joy. And I, I'm sure there are people in chat who, who, uh, you know, aren't as fortunate as me and you, and we haven't, they haven't had the time to like sit down and take all the fucking notes in the world. Right. Mm hmm. Um, question for really me where's my cat uh, I don't know where my cat is that's she's a cat it's hard to identify yeah. where a cat is at any given location or any given moment oh that wasn't uh, international mistake that wasn't Zelensky that was Ole Tiana book that you're thinking of the salute a uh, Tiana book it wasn't an, uh, it wasn't Zelensky you know um, yeah. if it, no Zelensky actually did it as a joke I think in a in a bit um, mm -hmm. he did a bunch of comedy and in fact he joked about how like uh, he was, you know, we, um, he joked about like talking to Washington or, or Biden or something like that and asking him for, for, um, you know, copy, a copy of Mein Kampf because they're all sold out in Ukraine. You know what I mean? So he's very much aware of the far right problem. Yeah. I mean, he is. And like, remember his, uh, <laughs> his prime minister like the guy who was his prime minister and he had worked with him i believe at the ministry of justice or something but the guy who was his prime minister is attending a fundraiser put on by a neo-nazi street gang like he's clearly aware of the implications of these things but he's either unbothered or it's he's un unable like I, I think probably politically these people have a lot of power behind the scenes and he's uh, unable to maybe offend them too severely. Okay. But I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm not him. I I have no understanding on his mindset with these matters. Right. I just know what's public. So. All right. All right. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Um. I I honestly don't have like questions. I don't have anything any anything else from chat. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, comments, uh, um, like what 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 was your how, how how do we how did you like learn about all these things? What were your main resources? How did you how did you piece this all together? Yeah. Um, so I mean, like I said, like I've been following this pretty loosely since since my dawn, right? right. Um, so I I follow online. I follow a few people who are interested in Ukrainian politics. So I see some of that stuff. Yeah. But um, basically what it was, was early in the war, because I've been following this stuff for a while, right? And uh, I knew about the neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine. Yeah. And then early into the war, um, everyone's like, no, there's not neo-Nazis. Isn't that weird? And, and like, there's no neo-Nazis. And I was like, what? And they're like, no, there's no neo-Nazi problem. And I was like, but no, but there is. And like, I felt like I was insane. Like I had like an you. argument with my dad where he was like, there's not, there's not. And he's like, are you, are you saying that it's okay for Russia to invade? I was like, what? Oh my no, God. Right. No, it's, it's not. So I had, um, you know, I, I had a class that was discussing Intel. Right. And one of the things was collect intelligence. So I was like, okay, this is a good chance for me to do this. So I basically spent a couple of weeks basically collecting this is largely like OSINT, like open source intelligence. So newspaper reportings, uh, firsthand accounts and stuff like that. And, you know, I kind of slowly combed through and put the pulled together sources and use that to, because each piece like the reporting is always very specific, especially on Azov. It's mm -hmm. like Azov did this one thing then and there's no broader context. So I just kind of had to go through and pick out these pieces and put them together into the bigger picture of what was going on. I mean, really, the thing I, I was like unaware of was how uh, how influential neo-Nazis were in the initial 2014 um, Euromaidan protests and the coup and all that. Like, you know, I had always assumed that they were there and kind of played an ancillary role. I didn't realize that, you know, the United States was egging them on from behind the scenes and that they took the reins. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, 
this is way worse than I thought. Like, you know, my expect my expectation going into it was that we have, you know, there's neo-Nazis there. They're a problem um, and they're isolated. And instead, it's like they're they're small. They're very small, but they have outsized influence um, because they helped form the current government. And that sucks. It really does. Yeah. Um, for me, I was like learning about it as, as it was happening. And yep. I was being told this sort of the same thing. Like the uh, if, if I reference anything that. You know, literally, people in Congress were saying uh, that we had a, a, a not, you know, we shouldn't be arming these people. You know what I mean? And if I say that same thing now, they literally say I'm doing Putin apologia, and I'm like, come on, dude, you have dude, obviously I, have no fucking clue what's happening here. Uh, that means that all of all of our Congress was doing Putin apologia. That means like everyone who reported on Azov, uh, uh, yes, uh, in the past uh, eight years, they were also doing Putin apologia. Fuck off, man. Not you. No, that, no, that's that's true. That is true. They were all doing Putin apologia. <laughs> and um, you did not know this, but 10 years from now, Putin develops a time machine. Yeah. And he is going to use that to go back and he's going to create Man. Azov. Right. In order to have a talking point. So uh, honestly, we all got played. Smart. That's big brain shit. Uh, Mega mind. Yeah. Mega That's mind. 5D here. chess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like the same reason. Like, I didn't really talk about it for like a while because I was like, I, like if I like say something about this, uh, like on Twitter, like I'm gonna get dogpiled and people are gonna be like, "Oh, so you support the Russian?" No, yeah. no, I don't fucking support Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Like, fuck right. them. But yeah, I also hate war crimes. Right? It's just like, what do they want us to do? It's like by denouncing it, is that gonna change anything? They just like it's all it's all vibes to them, man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's it's the kind of thing that like. It's it's like the whole invasion thing, like the whole denazification was like and that's, I think, what catalyzed all of this like gaslighting about it, because they're like, OK, well, if there actually are Nazis and they're a problem, then Putin was um, had a point somewhat. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe he wasn't entirely lying. Right. Um, and, you know, him saying that was entirely cynical. Obviously, you know, we, yeah. we have some native Nazis in Russia as well, right? Maybe there are uh, not as many in parliament or whatever, but, or in the National Guard as openly, but they're there, right? And it's like, you know, if his goal was denazification, like we're talking about like blowback, there's gonna be a lot of blowback from this. And there's going to, if anything, this is just going to, unless they get completely wiped out, this is going to just embolden neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine and elsewhere because they're going to have arms funding and more training and more combat experience, right? So if your goal was to denazify Ukraine, that's probably like one of the worst ways you could go about it unless his plan was just like, we're going to just go in, take over the whole country and, you know, do regime change and then get out, which would be insanely unrealistic anyways. Like, did he not watch what happened to us in Iraq? But... I don't know. I think like, you know, it's, it's kind of like the uh, at this point, everyone's just kind of like, well, let's press the military button and see what happened, because like we don't have any real control otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how much did you lose in crypto, Dan? <laughs> I didn't do crypto. Oh, really? I didn't do the crypto. I, I owe one hundred thousand dollars to some very scary people. And um, yeah, um, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Uh, I'm going to take out another loan to pay the back the the guys who loaned me for crypto. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, if I disappear, <laughs> if I disappear, uh, it's because a uh, uh, big pizza found me. Oh my god! Yeah. Big pizza. <laughs> big pizza. That's a Nick Lutzko reference. But uh, oh, I love Nick Lutzko. I love Nick Lutzko too. He's so funny. He's like, I need a hundred thousand uh, dollars, or my face is gonna look much worse. <laughs> <laughs> He's always sweaty as shit. It's the funniest thing. I know. I mean, he records in a sauna, so I love it. What? Like, yeah, yeah. You didn't notice that? Like, he always has like a wood wood background so he's definitely <laughs> recording in like an indoor sauna. Yeah. So he's just like getting super sweaty <laughs> and like sweaty. deranged. I thought he was like spraying himself or something. <laughs> No, I think he's like literally just, just sweat in a sauna, off. just so fucking hot and sweaty because he like <laughs> always gets sweatier and like wetter <laughs> as the songs go on and like 
<laughs> what the fuck? I am, he's like one of the wettest people alive. Yes, like, and I've seen what slick. he looks like, like normally, because like he's done like interviews in, in local magazines and stuff like that. And there's glamour photos of him and he looks fine. He looks handsome. Yeah. He looks normal. And then when he records videos, he's like <laughs> bright red and just dripping and like, damn. Get out. Get Homie's out got here. sweat. Homie sweating. Um, yeah, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't get into crypto. It seemed like one of those things where if, you know, if people, some people are going to get filthy rich, but most people are going to lose their money. And, and that, isn't that what exactly. just happened? Like I a mean, couple people yeah, got away with money. Pretty much. And this like current crash, uh, was specifically with like Luna and I'll give like a very brief explanation. Okay. It's probably a little over time. Um, but if you were. yeah, like it's going to, a lot of people are going to probably a lot of people are going to die as a result of this because from what? suicide oh. because uh yeah or just yeah we, we have lots of people who are like gonna lose everything like yeah. the the luna which was the crypto that crashed uh their subreddit the pinned tweet or the pinned post was a listing of suicide hotlines for every major country like it's very bad like the guy who founded this coin do kwan his wife has entered witness protection in South Korea. People have shown up at his apartment building, like trying to look for him. Yeah. Oops, wrong button. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. Um, so kind of explain like very yeah. briefly. So Luna was a crypto started by this guy, Do Kwan. Uh, and as of a couple weeks ago, it was the fourth one of the I think it was the fourth most popular crypto in the world. It had a really big market cap. It peaked at being like one hundred and sixteen dollars a coin. Um, so as far as these people were concerned, you know, it's going to the moon. Um, so a stable coin. So it is basically tied to a stable coin. Uh, stable coin. The idea is it's stable and it stays around. It stays pegged to one dollar of a currency. Most of them are pegged to USD. So basically Pegged. what that means is that <laughs> if you want to buy Bitcoin, um, you take $100 and you buy $100 of stable coin and then Tether or Terra, and then you use that to buy the Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, the big one is Tether, which provides the majority of liquidity for the crypto market. Um, and they, they claim they have money in reserves. They claim they have uh, $1 or one dollar in assets for every one dollar they have, but they absolutely do not because there's no way in hell they have eighty-two billion dollars and they are fucking lying. And the SEC said they were fucking lying. The SEC or the FTC said like they were lying about not having cash reserves like a year and a half ago when their market cap was seventy billion, and they're now at like eighty-two, eighty-three billion market cap, and they're just printing money, and they can do that, and they can print money forever until it crashes because they're such a big player that nobody's going to call their bluff. Uh, but with Terra, instead of having assets backing it up, it was an algorithmic stable coin, uh, meaning it was set to basically every time it would go down, um, they would encourage people to uh, basically sell it or sorry, to buy it and drive the price back up through basically giving them a favorable deal. And same thing on the other side to keep it like one dollar. Of course, no algorithmic stable coin has ever worked. Every single one has failed. And what happens is they're tied to another thing. So they go into a death spiral. Once their price drops, people start panicking and they start s selling it to buy the other one and then sell that. So it basically just triggers a death spiral, which is exactly what happened. Um, wow. It looks like it was intentionally attacked uh, because the founder of this crypto is like the biggest dick imaginable. He's like on Twitter being like, somebody told him, there was some research into it that's saying like, your cryptocurrency is very vulnerable to attack. And if you are attacked, it might go to zero and you might lose everything and your investors might lose everything. And he responded basically by being like, stop being poor, you moron. Like oh. you're a poor, it, yeah. He's like, you're poor, I don't care. Uh, and then he dares people to attack his coin and he has billionaires that follow him and he says i dare any of you to attack my coin you can't do it you can't attack my coin he ends up taking out uh, a 10 million dollar bet that his coin is not going to decrease in value uh. so he's egging on all these super rich people he's like i fucking dare you you can't attack my coin my coin is immortal it'll never go down and well it turns out 
uh, when you egg on a bunch of rich people who have uh, billions of dollars in liquidity, um, they can't attack your coin. And that's sorry about that. And that's exactly what happened. So it, we don't know how it happened, but somebody basically bought a bunch of it, held it, and then sold a ton of it and sold a ton of Bitcoin at the same time to drive the price down on both of them, which triggered panic. And then you have a run on the bank. And now mm -hmm. this crypto has gone from being worth 110 to essentially zero. Um, so oh even gosh. if you bought it, what looked like the bottom when it went to like one dollar you now have nothing <laughs> like it's just gone all of it is gone A reminder the first forms of crypto oh yeah the meme economy and rare pepes i mean rare pepes were yeah that was like the first kind of nft sort of thing right but um i mean the entire crypto market's just getting blown out you know like you might have talked about it. nft sales are down 92 percent yeah. Nobody's buying NFTs anymore. Uh, crypto prices are dropping. I mean, they've recovered somewhat since the initial shock. Bitcoin and Ethereum have, but they're still down like 50% for the past couple of months. 40% of crypto investors are underwater. So it's not good. It's, uh, I guess, buy the dip is what they're saying. Buy the dip, right? What? Hey, listen, sure, you lost $100,000, Dan, but. You need to take out a second mortgage and you need to buy that dip. These are prices you're never going to see again. They're so low. You got to buy more crypto. Oh, my God. Well, that's the thing. It's like whenever it price crashes, they're like, just buy the dip. Buy the dip and then it's going to go back up. Sometimes it does. Most of the time it doesn't. I'm not going to yes, buy it. Yes, I know, Ross. Do not buy. I am no. not a financial advisor. Do not buy crypto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, crypto, yeah, huh? a lot of people are going to be harmed by this. Uh, yeah. There's like a lot of people saying like, I lost pretty much everything. And, you know, like, sure, it was very ill-advisable to <laughs> probably invest everything you have in uh, a cryptocurrency that has no backing or no tangible value. I mean, as far as I know, you can't even buy drugs online with Luna. So I, I don't that know sucks. what the value was. What's the point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyways. Well, I mean, we told them. We told yeah we told you so i mean people have been saying like i mean the nfts like that seems like the you know right as a bubble is about to burst there's always that like last really heavy speculative frenzy that like just pushes up really high like right before a bubble bursts and that kind of seems like in retrospect maybe what the nft stuff was that it was like the last gasp uh before the bubble starts bursting but we oh. don't know you know crypto might just keep crashing over the next couple of weeks or months. Uh, it might recover. Um, Makes complete sense. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, we don't know how much exposure the major banks have. And also crypto is pretty closely correlated to Tesla. And Tesla is one of the, like, <laughs> Tesla is the kind of thing that like, even though Tesla is a scam, it's so integrated into the global economy that if Tesla crashes, you and I are going to have our next conversation in the uh, the hole of a burned out croaker. So, <laughs> oh my lord! All right. Yeah. Well. Anyways, well, thank you for yeah, having me yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Perfect. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's great. I'm glad that I could at least condense the information yeah. for everyone and uh, incredible. Put it back out there. Yeah. So. I'm sorry I couldn't provide too much new stuff, no. but uh, hopefully what I had was interesting for people. I don't. I, I'm. I'm sorry you're disappointed. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and I, I, I'm. Sh I, I. I know a lot of people learn things. I learned some stuff along the way, and it's. I learned through repetition, so it's just like it's good sure. for me to hear the same shit over and over again. Um, sure. Uh, you reminded me of that Tian Buck. Uh, Tian Buck. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, well, hanging Buck, out yeah. with Biden. I. T I totally forgot about that. Right. Yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. No, that was and off he, the charts. Yeah, he met with Obama too, I think. Yeah, yeah. I I'm think so. I'm not sure. That's, that rings a bell. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this guy. His name's Robbie Martin, Abby Martin's brother. Yeah. Fluorescent Gray. Uh, we had him on a couple a uh, couple months, about oh, two months cool. back, about maybe a couple weeks after um, the oh. Russian tanks rolled in. And uh, he's got a great um, trilogy documentary called A Very Heavy Agenda. And part two really goes into depth about that. And and actually, Abby's oh, Abby Martin's sort of uh, brush with uh, uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, 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 neoconservative uh, peoples, you know, 
uh, mm-hmm. fascinating stuff. I definitely suggest uh, my audience I'll, and I'll if you haven't check checked that, that out. out. I, I met good. Abby Martin for a half second once yeah. at uh, J20 at the inauguration. And oh. I was there with I was there with Answer Coalition, and this person oh. walks by, and I was like, "Was oh, that Abby Martin?" I was like, "Hi, hey, hi, yeah. are you are you Abby Martin?" And she's like, looks at me like, "Yeah," I'm like, "Big fan." She's like, "Cool, thank you." And walks yeah, away. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my meeting with the celebrity. Yeah, they're cool as fuck. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, buddy. Yeah. Uh, this is incredible. Right. Well, thank you so much for having on uh, having me on. Yeah. Everyone, it was great chatting yeah. with you. Uh, I'm Famous Horse, and I will see you guys later. All Have right. a lovely afternoon. Uh, All right. It's always a wonderful day in the neighborhood, right? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's a beautiful love day love in the neighborhood. Face. Bye-bye. All right, see you later. That's uh, That there was the Famous Horse. Look at that. Everyone say goodbye. Huge thanks to the patrons that keep this content alive. Thank you very much. Wow. Felt like a whirlwind just came through here. It was incredible, right? A good whirlwind.